The fourth chapter discusses the economics of natural resource extraction. The key questions that will be addressed are what types of natural resources are there and what are the differences between them? How are optimal rates of natural resource extraction determined and are these rates sustainable? The key concepts discussed are renewable resources, non-renewable resources, sustainability, extraction rates and maximum sustainable yield. Remember to add these to your glossary. Two types of natural resources exist, namely renewable and non-renewable exhaustible resources. Renewable resources are those resources that are able to regenerate themselves. Examples of renewable resources include living systems such as fisheries, forests and grazing lands, as well as non-living resources such as wind, solar radiation and wave energy. Non-renewable or exhaustible resources have a fixed stock that cannot grow. Not all of the stock may be available due to the cost of extraction. However, these may become available due to improvements in technology. Examples are coal, oil, gold and diamonds. The remainder of this chapter discusses the extraction of these types of resources in terms of sustainability. We will begin by looking at renewable resources before moving on to non-renewable resources. According to the 1987 Brundtlich Report, Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Therefore, it is necessary to improve current human well-being, but this should not be at the expense of future well-being. Hence, there is a need to minimize pollution and use resources responsibly. The way this is achieved lies in the ability to increase or minimally keep the capital stock constant over time. Capital refers to natural capital such as land and landscapes, flora and fauna, minerals, water and the atmosphere, manufactured capital such as machinery, buildings and infrastructure, human capital in the form of knowledge, skills, health and cultural endowment, social capital that is the institutions and the structures that allow individuals and groups to develop collaboratively, and financial capital, the value of which is simply representative of the other forms of capital. All types of capital, excluding natural, are referred to as human or man-made capital. Two types of sustainability exist, namely strong and weak sustainability. Strong sustainability rests on the assumption that natural and human-made capital are complementary. Thus, the stock of both capital should remain intact. There is thus no substitution between the two types of capitals, for example, you would always need timber as well as appropriate machinery and technical skills to produce paper. Weak sustainability assumes that the various types of capitals are completely substitutable. However, the total stock of capital assets should remain intact. So while the proportions of individual capital types may differ over time, the sum should remain constant. However, the role of technological progress and the degree of substitution between natural and human-made capital are critical assumptions to support this type of sustainability. For example, the ability to recycle paper or recoup more pulp from timber that is, improved, that is technological progress becomes critical to being able to use less timber and thus more machinery to produce the same quantity and quality of paper. Now, the important condition for weak sustainability is that the investment in human-made capital I is equal to or greater than the depreciation in human-made capital DM and the depreciation in natural capital DN. Renewable resources are natural resources that have the capacity to regenerate themselves. However, this depends on the management regime which is responsible for administering their use. These resources will only be able to regenerate themselves if they are used in a sustainable manner, that is, if a sustainable yield of the resource is harvested. If the harvest rate exceeds the sustainable yield, there will be a decrease in the total stock of the resource as the resource will not have a chance to regenerate itself. The resource may then become threatened with extinction. Extinction of renewable resource conflicts with the philosophy of sustainable development. Thus, the economic issue with regards to renewable resources is the optimum rate of harvesting, that is, the maximum rate at which they should be used, which will ensure that these stocks are maintained. As you will see, this differs from the economic analysis of non-renewable resources, which will invariably become depleted. However, even renewable resources can become depleted if they are over-exploited. 
This is particularly likely in the case of open access natural resources, where there is little incentive for, inv for individuals to use the resource in a sustainable way. The analysis of renewable resources is thus also considered with policy measures which can be used to protect the resource from unsustainable use. Our analysis will focus on biologically renewable resources, the classical example being that of fisheries. However, this analysis can be applied to other types of biologically renewable resources. Sustainable harvesting of marine resources requires that the catch rate or harvest rate H does not exceed the natural growth rate of the resource stock, which is G, which is the rate at which the population can regenerate itself. Harvest rates that exceed the growth rate are unsustainable, since the population is unable to regenerate itself and the stock size will decline. If overfishing continues, the population will eventually be driven to extinction. The natural growth rate of a marine population is the growth rate ignoring mortality due to harvesting. This is the growth rate that occurs when the population is not harvested as a resource. This is illustrated by means of a stock size curve, which shows stock size as a function of time, and a corresponding population growth curve, which assumes that population growth is a logistic function of the stock size. This is known as density-dependent growth. Note that in the first diagram, Population growth does not begin at a zero stock size. Rather, there is a critical minimum stock size indicated by Esmin that must exist before the population is able to multiply. However, to simplify the analysis, we will assume from now on that population growth begins at zero, as shown in the second diagram. Initially, population growth is slow, but at a certain point, the fish are able to multiply rapidly. However, this growth rate reaches a maximum when the population reaches a certain level, when individuals begin to compete for food and so the population growth curve reaches a turning point and begins to decline. This is indicated by the point marked Gmax. Thereafter, the population is still growing but at a decreasing rate. The growth rate reaches zero when the population reaches the maximum size which the environment is able to support, indicated by Smax. This is known as the carrying capacity of the environment. Introducing fisheries to the simple population growth model implies a distinction between the natural growth rate G and the actual growth rate S hat, which is the actual rate of change in the resource stock, taking into account mortality due to harvesting. The actual growth rate is equal to the difference in stock size between one time period and the next. If there is no harvesting of the resource, then the actual growth rate, S hat, is just equal to the natural growth rate, G. However, if the resource is harvested, then the actual growth rate differs from the natural growth rate by the rate of harvesting, H, that is, by the catch rate. Thus, the actual growth rate is equal to the natural growth rate, less the rate at which the resource is harvested. The maximum sustainable yield, MSY, is the highest catch rate which ensures that the stock size does not decline. Thus, the MSY is the maximum possible catch rate at which there is zero actual growth in the size of the resource. Thus, if harvesting at the MSY, the harvest rate of the resource must equal its natural growth rate. If the catch rate exceeds the natural growth rate, then the actual growth rate is negative and the population will decline and may become threatened with extinction. Thus, such a catch rate is unsustainable. On the other hand, if the catch rate is below the natural growth rate, then the actual growth rate is positive and the population will increase over time. Although such a catch rate is sustainable, it is clearly not the maximum sustainable yield, since the catch rate can be increased without resulting in a decline in the population. The population growth curve is equivalent to a sustainable use curve, because any catch rate that is equal to the population growth rate is a sustainable one since any such catch rate implies that the actual growth rate, S hat, is zero. However, while all points on the sustainable use curve are sustainable, only one point on the sustainable use curve corresponds to the maximum sustainable yield, MSY, which can be obtained if the resource is harvested at a rate just equal to the maximum rate of natural population growth, Gmax, as seen in the population growth curve earlier. At this rate, the highest po possible catch is produced, and at the same time, the stock is given the chance to regenerate itself 
implying that the resource can be sustained indefinitely. A harvest rate of H1 is clearly unsustainable. At any given stock size, H is greater than G and the population will tend towards zero. However, for harvest rate H2, A and B represent sustainable equilibrium harvest with H equal to G. Note that point B represents a safe stable pop equilibrium. If the actual stock size is less than or greater than S double prime, the stock size will move back towards S double prime. A is not a safe equilibrium. If stock size is greater than S prime, the stock will grow to S double prime. But if stock size is less than S prime, then the stock size will tend towards zero. Note that this is also true for harvest rate equal to the MSY. If actual stock size is less than S MSY, then the population will tend towards zero. The point of this discussion is that while well, H is equal to MSY is often proposed as the biological optimum, it seems safer to aim at a harvest rate less than MSY, such as H2, and a stock size greater than S MSY, such as S double prime. As you will see, this is exactly the outcome suggested by consideration of the economic rather than the biological optimum. The MSY, while perhaps optimal from a biological point of view, is not necessarily optimal from an economic point of view. The maximum sustainable yield must be distinguished from the maximum economic yield, MEY, which is the catch rate at which pro profit is maximized. Unlike the MSY, which depends only on the natural growth rates of the population, the MEY depends on market conditions, that is, on the costs associated with fishing and on the prices that can be obtained from selling each unit of fish. However, whether or not the actual equilibrium will be at the point of economic optimum depend, depends on the management regime, that is, on whether the resource is under open access or private ownership. To explain the economic equilibrium that results under these two management regimes, we return to our familiar diagram, but with a number of important differences. Firstly, the horizontal axis is replaced with fishing effort, E, which is a measure of the amount of time spent fishing or the number of boats involved in harvesting the resource or both. Since greater fishing effort results in a lower stock and vice versa, the horizontal axis is now the reverse of that in, pre in our previous diagrams, where we had stock in the horizontal axis, stock decreases as greater fishing effort is applied, that is, as we move from left to right along the horizontal axis. Secondly, the concept of total cost and total revenue have been added. The total cost of harvesting is equal to the amount of effort exerted multiplied by the cost per unit of effort. Assume that the cost per unit effort is equal to the hourly wage rate W earned by fishermen. Thus, the total cost of fishing is a, of a certain population is equal to the wage rate multiplied by the amount of effort exerted in fishing that population. Since W is assumed to be constant, the total cost of fishing increases as the amount of fishing effort increases. The total revenue, TR, earned from harvesting the resources equal to the number of units, example kilograms of fish caught, that is at the harvest rate H multiplied by the market price P per unit of fish caught. Note the TR curve has the same shape as the yield curve of the previous diagram. Since market price P is assumed to be constant, TR, which is P times H, will follow the same pattern as the harvest rate, increasing at low levels of effort but at a decreasing rate, the upward sloping portion of the curve eventually reaching a point where each additional unit of effort applied results in less of the resource being harvested and thus adding less to total revenue, the downward sloping portion of the curve. In an open access situation, the resource is in question is not privately owned and there are no rules governing use of the resource, meaning that anybody is free to harvest the resource. In this situation, people will harvest the resource as long as profits are there to be earned. Profits are earned whenever total revenue is above total curve cost, that is, as long as the TR curve is above the TC line. Thus, an open access fishery will be exploited up until the point where TR is equal to TC, 
that is, the point at which the TR curve intersects the TC line and falls below it. The open axis equilibrium, this occurs where the level of effort applied is equal to EOA and the amount of the resource harvested equals HOA. Note that this level of fishing effort exceeds the effort level corresponding to the maximum sustainable yield, while, which is shown by the point labeled EMS1. This does not mean that the resource will necessarily become extinct, although the danger of extinction is relatively high given that EOA is quite close to Emax. The total, the level of effort at which the population will become extinct. However, notice that the flatter the TC line, the closer EOA is to Emax. This implies that at lower cost of harvesting, more individuals will harvest the resource, increasing the danger of extinction. Thus, unless the costs of harvesting are excessively high, open access fisheries are unlikely to be utilized in a sustainable manner. In the case of private ownership, the fisheries owned by a single owner, whose aim is to, is to maximize profits, that is, maximize the difference between total revenue and total costs. The private ownership equilibrium occurs at a level at a level of effort equal to EPO, where HBO is harvested. At this point, the vertical distance between the TR and TC curves is at its greatest, indicating that the difference between total revenue and total cost is maximized. This can be explained in another way. According to economic theory, profit is maximized at the point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Marginal revenue is indicated by the slope of the total revenue curve, while marginal cost is indicated by the slope of the total cost curve. Thus, the point at which marginal revenue equals marginal cost is the point at which the slope of the total revenue curve equals the slope of the total cost curve. This occurs where a line that is parallel to the T line labeled PAR is tangent to the TR curve. That is, at the private ownership equilibrium point, EPO. Notice that this level of effort, EPO, is below the level of effort con corresponding to the maximum sustainable yield, EMSY, only if no costs were involved with the private owner harvest the MSY. EPO is also much lower than EMAX. This private ownership may be beneficial in terms of conservation since the individual owner has an incentive to protect his resource stock. From a policy perspective, the most important thing to notice is that the private ownership equilibrium, EPO, implies a level of fishing effort that is lower than that implied by open access equilibrium and thus corresponds to a higher level of the resource stock. Private ownership thus appears to be more in line with the goals of conservation and sustainable development than open access. To summarize, open access resources provide no economic incentive to ensure that the resource is harvested at a level that does not place the population in danger of extinction. On the other hand, private ownership appears to ensure that the resource is harvested in a manner that will ensure its continued regeneration. Furthermore, in an open access situation, the lower the cost of extraction, the greater the danger that the resource will be exploited to extinction. These conclusions suggest two possible economic instruments as management policies. Firstly, users of an open access resource should be subject to some sort of charge or levy. This will serve to increase the cost of extraction, raising the total cost curve and thus ensuring that open access equilibrium occurs at a lower level of fishing effort, implying a higher level of stock. Secondly, open access resources should be subject to some sort of ownership rights. Private ownership is preferable from an economic perspective. However, if private ownership is not politically feasible, another option is that of common property, where the resource is communally rather than privately owned, and there are rules and regulations governing use of this resource. The common property equilibrium lies between EPO and EOA, implying that communal ownership may at least be an improvement on the open access scenario. Non-renewable resources have a fixed stock that cannot grow over time. The size of the available stock is determined firstly by economic considerations, that is, the price of extraction versus the selling price. This part of the, part of the stock, that is the economic stock, 
can be extracted due to economic viability, while another part is too expensive to extract due to high extraction costs. This is known as sub-economic stocks. Secondly, as technology improves, sub-economic stocks become more economically viable to extract. The question regarding the extraction of non-renewable resources and sustainability relates to how this is achieved from an economic perspective. Economically, if strong sustainability is assumed, then society should invest in renewable resources as these resources are extracted. According to weak sustainability, investments can be made into either natural or human-made capital. Mining and mineral processes are important sources of income and are often the driving forces behind broader economic development. However, without proper management by government, mining companies and civil society and the optimization of net benefits to society, sustainable development and the potential of non-renewable resources will not be realized. How do we know if the rates of extraction by profit maximizing firms are appropriate from society's perspective? This societal rate of extraction can be calculated using Hotelling's rule. However, due to its technical nature, it is not covered here. If you're interested in, re in this rule, you may read about it in almost any environmental and resource economics textbook. The conclusions from the Hotelling's rule are that the resource price will increase over time, and that owners of the resource will be able to extract a resource rent as the price of the resource is higher than the marginal extraction cost. The rate of extraction is determined by the availability of substitutes such as renewable energy rather than fossil fuels, new technology, and the potential for reuse and re recycling of resources. The existence of substitutes leads to a choke price. This is the point where substitutes become economically viable given the cost of the non-renewable resources. Therefore, optimization of the resource should result in the stock being depleted as this choke price is reached. Given this point, the rates of extraction should be calculated working backwards. However, several difficulties derive from this equilibrium theory. Firstly, stock prices fluctuate over time, often with no bearing on the discount rate. Secondly, we don't know how the equilibrium is reached. Thirdly, there are no guidelines in terms of market development in price and quantity or out of the equilibrium path. Finally, if initial prices are too high, parts of the stock will still be left in the ground by the time the choke price is reached as it will be a high initial conservation rate. In essence, the idea of extracting non-renewable resources contradicts the concept of sustainable development, as the resource is no longer available to future generations and the extraction creates externalities. First, government intervention is necessary to deal with both of these issues. Firstly, government provides policies that attempt to lead to the internalization of environmental externalities. These policy options include the implementation of market-based mechanisms such as environmental taxes and subsidies or command and control measures such as standards, quotas and direct legislation and regulations. These concepts were discussed in the previous chapter. Secondly, government needs to implement policy that captures the resource rent since the economic rent that is generated from the extraction of the resource belongs to society but is being appropriated by mining companies. Profit-based taxes were initially implemented, but due to most mining companies not being profitable and thus making losses or having narrow margins, the returns to society are thus negligible and or not guaranteed. As a result, mining royalties are being discussed as a means of ensuring a just contribution in return for exploitation rights.